All right, before we get started with uh, Meet the Fed, we're going to play Spot the Lamer. Every year here at DEF CON, you guys play Spot the Fed, try to embarrass the Fed. Well, we thought uh, this is going to be the fourth year that we're going to pick some poor some bitch that uh, is a lamer. So, uh, obviously, Priest uh, picked them. So, if you guys could uh, kind of line up in front here so that everybody could see you. By the way, was this the problem? Uh, could you do that for the video so we get a good f- picture of your ass? Okay. Let me turn it up. That's good. That's good. Okay. Where's the IRS? Okay. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to start asking questions to each of the panel members. We're going to start with. Uh, Ken Privet from Postal, and we're going to work our way down here, and then this way. So, pick a number. Hey, priest, we need this asshole removed over here. <laughs> Come on, quick, let's go, hubba hubba. <clears throat> Where's the best best place to store porn? I'll give you two, two answers. Your neighbor's box over the Wi-Fi or your box? Pick a number, Ken. Who do you want to answer? Oh, this gentleman here. <laughs> okay. Okay, you've been eliminated. You can sit down now. And not here. Thank you. Mike. All right, um, let's see. Name at least five uh, Intel x86 machine instructions and two mock instructions. Who do you want to answer? I added the last part. They gave me the first part, but I added the last part because I want to see if you really know. (laughs) All right, see you later. Time's up. Stay right where you are because you look like a lamer. Next one. Yeah. Question goes to you. Can you name the entire Skywalker family? That's pretty. No. Okay. Too bad. Okay, Mike. He's pleading the fifth. John Garris. For this gentleman here in the uh, rather aggressive arms cross posture. Um. <laughs> Have you coded more than 200 versions of Hello World programs in your life? No, I don't think so. How many have you coded? Oh, at least 20. There you go. Stay up here. Barry. Okay, for the contestant on the end, which of the following regarding the iPhone uh, applies to you? A, you did the jailbreaking thing right away. B, you mostly use it to watch Battlestar Galactica. Or C, are you effing kidding me? I'm sorry, if this is a civil service exam, we need to make this fair and balanced. So can we get her a copy of the question since she's an underrepresented group? <laughs> I don't evaluate. I'll choose D, I don't have one. Did you hear that comment, you asshole, the other? All right, um, second from the end. Louder. How many external media devices do you own, and how many are on you now? That sounds like a personal question. Michelle. What time do you have to be at work? What time do you get there? Gentleman in black here. When does December 25th equal October 31st? Could you repeat that, please? 
when does DEC 3025 equal OCT 31? Come on, this is only an hour and a half. Let's go. <laughs> this is basketball. That's okay. Decimal 25 is octal 31. Pass the mic. Number two, uh, do you still live in your parents' basement? <laughs> what, uh, what floor of your parents' house do you live on? <laughs> okay, could all the contestants please raise your hand? Yeah, let us have a shot. Well, I'm going to get to that. Okay, now, if you well, come on higher, uh, we want them to see. If you have never hacked a government system, put your hand down. Oh, you guys hesitate. <laughs> Three of you. Okay, Rich. What is better for uh, sniffing traffic, network traffic, a hub or a switch, and why? Okay, Marcus. I'm going to talk to this lamer here in green. If if I put is, is this about the bed? If I put my card in promiscuous mode, what does it mean? You're getting stopped for the sexual harassment suit. <laughs> it means you don't work for me anymore. There you go. <laughs> Okay, having experienced what you've experienced, given a choice next year of coming to DEF CON and getting embarrassed as hell, or staying home and getting laid, which would you prefer? <laughs> Actually, this will only apply to the three women. Those guys, two guys wouldn't get laid at home either. <laughs> uh, show of hands, you have two hands? Anything. They said yes. Okay, for beer man. How do you feel about employers requiring you to look professional? I believe that it's not required. They didn't hire me for my looks. They hired me for my... No shit. <laughs> Who coined the term cybercop? Oh, come on, self plug. Moving right along. This is for either of the two gentlemen. In your opinion, what's the best way to pack code? <laughs> Um, number two, do you still tell your mom and dad good night? Well, since I'm in that basement, all I have to do is yell out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you would all face the uh, the judges. Okay, raise your hand. Number one, with the hat and the beer. If you think he's the lamer, please clap. <laughs> Sit down. Number two, please raise your hand. Let's hear it for number two. Okay, number one, you could sit down. Number three, would you raise your hand? Number three. Okay, number four, raise your hand. Higher. Okay, number four. We're going to keep you up here because you're cute. Number five. Raise your hand. Okay, number five. Anybody? 
Okay, number one or number four? One, raise your hand. Number four, raise your hand. Okay, we're still going to keep you. <laughs> if, if you raise your shirt, you get more votes. Fuck it, I'm retired. <laughs> okay, number number one, you're number one now, you're number two. Number one, let's hear for one. Number two. Okay. okay, two, you can have a seat. I'm sorry. Okay, number one. The new number two. I'm sorry, honey. We're going to have to send you home. <laughs> Number one. And our lady. I'm sorry, you. Okay. What we would like to award you with. And what, what's, your, what's, your, what's your first name? Amy. Amy. We have this coveted Spot the Fed t-shirt for you. And now everybody, if you just walk down there, everybody has a gift for you. A small gift for you. Okay, but you have to walk faster. Amy, Amy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Speak loudly Don't into work it. at government speech, please. <laughs> <laughs> Is that guy still here? That's where you have the bag. <laughs> Space shuttle pack. First time not being handcuffed in a bedroom. Thanks, priest, for all the help. By the way, if it was a guy, they would have tackled him. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing that in the hallway. <laughs> okay, what we're going to do is we're going to start with Ken Privet and let everybody introduce themselves, talk about two minutes on their agency, what they do, and then we're going to open it up uh, to questions. So formulate your questions and... Uh, we have a microphone down here so everybody else can hear. So if you want to start forming a line. Oh, that's okay. 
Hi, Ken Privet. I'm an agent in charge of the Postal Service, uh, Digital Evidence Services. Um, we do computer crime investigations and do uh, computer forensics for the Postal Service to support investigations. Uh, some of the problems you guys create, we kind of end up with uh, sweeping them up and taking care of them. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, 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 these guys. The bureaucracy mostly, yeah, yeah, that's my problem. No, um, um, in, in the Postal Service is a massive amount of uh, computer infrastructure. Um, one of the third, I think the third largest infrastructure in the, uh, in the United States. It, um, a lot of computers that push the mail around and, uh, and help it get delivered to you. So we secure that infrastructure and, and do the investigations to support it. Here we go. Hey, I'm Colonel Mike Convertino from the U.S. Air Force um, down in San Antonio, the 318th Information Operations Group. We specialize in network access engineering down there. And um, basically, I'm here to recruit you, not arrest you like some of the people on this uh, stage. So I'm the good guy. <laughs> in fact, uh, how I came to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> Well, as evidence of that, last year we hired over 60 people into the Air Force as a result of my visit to this conference. So, so actually, it is true. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm, I guess also I'm somewhat the most similar to any of you up here on this stage, too, because I started off with a, an interest in electronics as a very young boy. I got sent to a summer camp one time. My mom sent me there. I met a girl. So you can say that I uh, started this out of started this is uh, interest in this uh, is part of uh, you know for love you know yeah and I, <laughs> so anyway yeah, I wanted to call her afterward and I combined my uh, interest in her with my interest in electronics to make the phone system do what I needed to do so. My other, uh, yeah, yeah, today it probably would be considered stocking, but so my, my, uh, my other, uh, my handle is, is loopback. I don't know if you know me from online, so anyway. Did you say humpback? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Stéphane Turgeon. I'm a sergeant with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I'm, uh, <clears throat> there you go. Are you a Montreal Canadiens fan or Ottawa? Toronto. Toronto? No. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so I'm. Yeah. Go ahead. You want a hat? Now, good for you. I'm not taser trained, so I, if I have to arrest you someday, uh, you'll be lucky. No, uh, seriously, I'm in charge of the computer crime section in Ottawa, and uh, we deal with the uh, computer crime investigations involving ter uh, sorry, terrorism, drugs, organized crime, national security, and, of course, computer intrusion. Uh, I'm here. Uh, first time. It's my first time here. I'm really happy to see all of you guys, and actually, I'm also here to recruit. So if you have any... Any suggestions, any ideas to help us help, help us the RCMP? Then we'll be here uh, to uh, receive you. You were. Do you take American citizens? Mm. Serious question. Serious question. Uh, it it all depends on the cases. Uh, I assume so. We could. It depends. <laughs> Need a visa. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Rule number one: Never follow a guy with the sexy accent. Um, <laughs> John Garris, I run the Computer Crimes Division for NASA IG. Uh, I think you know what NASA does, so I won't go into that. I was going to talk about my Air Force experience, but I don't know if I want to be associated. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I, what I do have to offer, though, 
is uh, <laughs> coveted NASA IG ninja throwing discs <laughs> that also happen to double as coasters, but, you know, you can, you can decide. And uh, it, it depends on somebody who can uh, come up with something, uh, you know, meaningfully flattering for me, you know, th- you know through the... Uh, and anything that this guy... You know, if you can do anything about this guy, you get two. <laughs> My name is Barry Grundy. I'm a special agent with the Treasury's Inspector General for Tax Administration. Um, I've, I've only been there for about five months. I'm, I'm in the, the uh, network intrusions unit. We do network intrusions, phishing investigations. I've only been there for about five months. I used to work for John Garris here at NASA beforehand. Uh, and I, John fired him. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I'm actually, uh, I, I actually replaced uh, this guy down here, uh, Andy Freed. And I don't know if those of you who know Andy know. He got fired, too. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who know Andy know that when he left, he left a huge knowledge vacuum, and I'm, I'm in there trying to fill it, uh, trying to fill his big shoes by pissing off as many people as I can as quick as I can, and trying to unlearn all my interpersonal skills as quick as I can, too. Um, but yeah, seriously, what we do is uh, TIGTA, the, the, the group TIGTA does oversight for the IRS, so we protect the tax infrastructure for the IRS, and that includes the network uh, intrusions and other computer crimes. So that's it. I'm Paul Sternel. I'm the program manager for the Computer Crimes Unit for the Defense Criminal Investigative Service. We're the criminal investigative arm of the DOD IG. Um, you may have heard of the Department of Defense or a small U.S. government department. <laughs> That's about it. What is DOD just, just, ig- just ignore the asshole. Okay. <laughs> I'm Michelle Kwan. I'm the director of U.S. CERT. And we work with the departments and agencies in the .gov portion of the, of the government um, in incident response and general security. We also uh, work in conjunction with uh, state and locals, international, uh, and industry, and collaborating and coordinating during incidents. And we are also here recruiting. So if you are interested in a job, we have jobs posted on USA Jobs, and you can always come up and see me too. My name is Lynn Wells. I'm with the National Defense University, which is in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have a couple of things that really might be of interest to you all. Uh, one is the Information Resource Management College, uh, which uh, has some terrific opportunities for uh, people with advanced degrees, uh, also grants, certificates, and things like that, and things like CIO and CISO. But it's also got a batch of closed uh, networks, so you can go out and just uh, hack creative systems and hack uh, avatars and uh, uh, hack things to your heart's content, and uh, it's a really good training device. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work on social software and national security, how you have to balance the risks and the, and the gains, and would very much uh, welcome some of your insights into that. And we also are looking for leveraging the great talent that's out here and uh, seeing and find ways to work together. Thanks. Hi, my name is uh, Gordon Snow. I'm the uh, uh, Section Chief for the Cyber National Security Section of the FBI, and I'm also the Director of the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force. Um, in my job as Cyber National Security Section Chief, uh, I coordinate the cyber investigations that uh, cross terrorism, intelligence, uh, counterintelligence, and the law enforcement uh, equities of the 56 field offices that we have and the 60 legal attaches we have around the world. In the, uh, as a director of the NCIJTF, I do the same thing for the 18 member organizations that are there. Um, we have uh, jobs, obviously, in, uh, in the agent field, in the intelligence field, in the forensics field. And since we are an equal opportunity employer, um, I'm here to arrest or recruit. <laughs> it's the same thing. Hi, I'm Rich Marshall. I'm first generation de- uh, Grateful Dead. <laughs> really miss Jerry. I'm recovering, though. Um, I work for the National Security Agency. I've had 27 drug tests in the last three years. <laughs> I pass all of them because they ask you to provide a urine sample. So, But you have to study it. for it, right? Um, the National Security Agency section that I work for provides um, information system security solutions for uh, national security telecommunications and information systems. Um, 
So that's probably one of the more important things that we do. Mark? This is like Alcoholics Anonymous. I am an ex-Fed. Hi, Mark. I'm Mark Sox. I run the Internet Storm Center. I used to be at DHS. I was at White House before that and our military before that, JTFC and D. I am a U.S. citizen. I normally carry. We can't really do that in the casinos. I do believe in the Second Amendment. Uh, my name is Andrew Freed. I'm a former IRS person. I'm sure some of you have heard of us before. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of years ago, my boss says, don't do anything stupid. So I was the one that got married on stage here in DEF CON two years ago. Uh, I've come, this is my 10th or 11th DEF CON, and uh, I think I've been pretty active in a lot of the groups you probably are all part of yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Greg Garcia. Jerry's reincarnation, uh, president of uh, the cleverly named Garcia Strategies, a consulting firm. At the Department of Homeland Security, I was uh, the first assistant secretary for cybersecurity and communications. Um, as assistant secretary, I guess to my staff, my, my handle was, was ass. Uh, as assistant secretary for cybersecurity and communications, I was responsible for three things, the National Cybersecurity Division, uh, of which uh, Michelle Kwan is, is a part. The National Communication System, which uh, keeps our communications infrastructure up and running in times of national emergency. Uh, and the Office of Emergency uh, Communications. Uh, so I, I have to say, uh, for the two years that I was at DHS, left in December, I, I probably uh, did 100 or more keynote addresses across the country and internationally. Uh, and this is the first time that I ever looked this cool. My name is Kevin Manson, and I'm a webaholic. <laughs> You're supposed to say, hi, Kevin. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I am the one that coined the term uh, cyber cop back in the late 80s, and uh, I was with DHS at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. I had the privilege of training over 100,000 agents over my 20-year career. And one of the things I'm most proud of is training federal agents how to obey the law while they enforce it. Eight years ago, I was privileged. Uh, I, I was actually given a call when Richard Clark was not able to keynote the Black Hat Conference. I got a call from a dear friend of mine, Bill, Bill Tafoya. Bill was with the FBI Behavioral Science Unit. And he did the definitive profile of Ted Kaczynski. And a member of the History Channel had interviewed Bill, and they asked him, who do you think this individual is going to be when you catch him? And he said, I think it's going to be a monk on a mountain in Montana. So when Bill called me, he said he'd been asked to keynote, fill in for... Uh, for National Security Advisor Richard Clark, and he said that he had gladly accepted that. He said he wanted to add one uh, requirement. He said he wanted his friend to co keynote with him. He called me and asked me if I wanted to do that, and I said, Bill, what small body parts do you want? So I was very privileged to do that. I've, this is only my third uh, Black Hat DEF CON, but uh, one thing I did note when I keynoted back in 2001, and I, I noted that the true elite are not those who are out there wreaking havoc on the internet. The true elite of the Rose are out here defending it, and I'm proud to say I'm associated with so these kinds of people have been doing that for a long time. If you want to take a look at something, a project that I'm also very involved with, and uh, if you go and take a look at my website, which is, it's a long one, I apologize, but it's redtapewillnotdefeatterrorism.org. I am having second doubts about that. If they had to deal with some of the red tape that I saw in my 20 years in government service, we could probably defeat them handily. <laughs> but if you take a look at it, it's, it's a project that we are urging those of you who really do believe that the true elite are those who are defending. We'd urge you to join us. It's a non-government entity, basically. So Your we, 12 minutes is up now. Thank you. <laughs> Oops. No problem. Thank you. My name is Ray Kesnick. I'm a retired special agent with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. Um, my last few years I spent as the director of the Defense Cyber Investigative Training Academy in uh, Maryland. I'm currently the director of training for the International Multilateral Partnership Against Cyber Threats, kind of a tortured long name, but it's IMPACT, based out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. 
We have a, a stated goal of assisting developing countries as they come online, giving them the security tools and, uh, and training necessary so they can do it on a level playing field. And I appreciate your having me here today. Thank you. I'm Bob Hopper. I'm with the National White Collar Crime Center. How many of you guys have ever heard of that? Everybody that raised their hand is a cop. <laughs> right? I mean, if you want to know who we are and what we do, please go to our website, nw3c.org. I'm here recruiting. How many of you have a resume with you right now? Come see me. If you can, if you can decipher the information on this coin, the hex and binary, we'll talk. Thanks. My name is uh, Jamie Turner. I work with NCIS, and um, I never really like be here. I like to be surfing back home, Hawaii. Uh, but I had to come. So uh, uh, I work with NCIS, and uh, part of their mission is to uh, investigate and solve those crimes that affect the war fighting capabilities of the Department of the Navy and the United States Marine Corps. And uh, we have a cyber division. I work with that division, looking at the infrastructure, uh, conducting computer operations and investigations and uh, this also gives me a chance to thank a lot of you guys that are here because and the panel too because um, you know I go by different handles uh, some know me as a Jesus Christ warrior uh, full thought Christian or just whatever and I am a Christian but you guys if I, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if you guys haven't helped me and some of these guys on this panel so I want to say to you uh, from my heart to you brother to sister brother to brother this is like one Ohana like one big family and no, nothing bad it's all good. And I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here and talk story. Okay, the microphone's down here. Now the rest of the night is uh, up to you guys. Uh, questions? Sir. Hey, Dr. W Dr. Wells. Lynn. How you doing, man? Good. I, I just want to let you know that the U.S. Air Force still loves you. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> and uh, you can explain to people later why we say that. <laughs> I have a question, sir. Uh, it could go to any panel member. Uh, there are many uh, people representing a broad part of the government here, but not that many war fighters, people whose DNA might be the principles of war, mass, observation, surprise, security. So. But we're headed into a lane where there are going to be war fighters. Uh, I think when, when uh, Colonel Convertino said he was recruiting, part of that includes a need for youngsters to come into war fighting as well as intel. My question is, how are we doing at setting up a U.S. Cybercom from your point of view? Uh, how will DHS get along with uh, the war fighting part that's emerging very strongly? And um, how do you see our ability to, to uh, conduct war operations uh, in cyberspace uh, developing? Thanks, sir. Mike, you want to start with that one? Uh, sure. I, I, I think uh, we've gotten off to a pretty uh, fast start with the U.S. Cyber Command stand-up. Um, we... Uh, my unit is part of uh, part of the Air Force component to U.S. Cyber Command, uh, 24th Air Force, which will basically operationally directly su uh, support U.S. Cyber Command. It's in the process of being stood up down in San Antonio, where I am, and uh, we're looking forward to all that. And, and you're right, um, there's a certain wartime or uh, war focus to that, and supporting supporting the networks that we that we operate on. But also holding our enemies' networks at risk are, are pretty key uh, to that, and um, and we're busily trying to buttress our forces in that area uh, right now, which is part of why I'm here to recruit. And as far as the rest goes, I think I'll let I'll let Lynn uh, answer the rest. So I think one of the things you need to do to stand up an effective change like Cyber Command, like the ability to get effective war fighting, is you have to have to address sort of four areas. You have to address people, and you have to address processes, and you have to address technology, and you have to address organizations. So Cyber Command begins to take care of the organizational piece. It sort of begins to take care of the, um, uh, the people piece, but not really. So we have to co-evolve all of those. 
And part of the organization is how we interact with the rest of government. I think um, that uh, a lot of work has been given to understanding how this will interface with uh, DHS. I can't speak for DHS on how they view it or how they will respond, but I think from the president on down, based on the sort of review he did of the cyber threat a few months ago, everyone understands that this is a national problem and is going to require a national solution, not just the Department of Defense. So I think all of us involved in this uh, realize it's got to be a, not only a whole of government, but a whole of nation. There has to be a uh, private sector. There has to be a business community. There has to be a whole of government approach to this. So we don't really have a choice if we're going to be effective in this space. Uh, so I think it's important. I think we've taken some first steps. Uh, we still have a long way to go. And speaking for DHS, we do see this as a team sport. Um, we do see this has more than just war. There's, as, as we know from our law enforcement partners here up on the, on the panel as well, um, there's a criminal element to this as well. And this is definitely a team sport. We definitely need the assistance of, of private industry and our international partners as well. And uh, we have been doing this well so far, and I think we can do it better, and we'll continue to do it better and continue to work together. Next question, sir. Hi. Uh, you, uh, this is this question is for the Postal Service or and maybe others. Uh, you probably can't tell by the way I'm dressed, but I, I win the lottery by email almost every week. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean the amount of uh, fraud. Uh, on the Nigerian uh, fishing expeditions and others on the internet is. It's just massive. Is there a website that uh, we can just forward these uh, messages to, to so uh, s some, some of the people in the feds can uh, slow, slow the fraud down a little bit? Have you paid taxes on those winnings yet? <laughs> <laughs> Everything he's got. NW3C, with, in partnership with the FBI, has a site that you can actually do that. It's uh, IC3, IC3.org. Um, got it? Um, actually, the, the FBI does a really excellent job of cobbling, doing some analysis and cobbling those cases together and either investigating those on their own or shipping them out to jurisdictions that are appropriate. Um, and NW3C side of that is to kind of do the same thing. We don't do the, the level of analysis that the FBI is able to do, uh, but we do essentially the same thing they do, and that is identify the, the law enforcement agencies that might be able to impact it. and. Uh, get those cases to the right people. And hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Andy, did you want to take that? Go with it, Andy. <clears throat> well, I, I, I mean, I've been pretty heavily involved in phishing and fraud. And I would say that maybe out of uh, you know, 10 million offenses that you've probably got in your email box, I think the federal government maybe has made three to five arrests. So it's a big problem, and I'm not sure it's an easily solved problem. I think the good spam filters are probably a better solution than assuming law enforcement is going to protect you because there's just so much of it out of there. I think I know how to solve the problem. Use the mail. You know, don't don't use this email stuff, guys. <laughs> solve that. Yeah. Yeah. It's dangerous out there, guys. Dangerous. Use the mail. <laughs> Next question, sir. It's no secret that, the, um, that various worms and Trojans have significantly impacted coalition operations in Afghanistan and Iraq over the past 12 months. What lessons have been learned, and what are you guys planning to do to make sure that that sort of thing doesn't put our guys in greater danger than they already are? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, <clears throat> that DOD has undertaken a, a great number of efforts to try and both uh, um, correct the, uh, I guess, the 
the needy end of the network's patching capabilities to try and get get patches out to the appropriate people out out in the field, but also to um, to put in place better mitigation efforts for when compromises do happen. Make sure that the uh, make sure that exfiltrations really can't happen um, or are much more difficult to to make occur, um, and also a certain amount of discipline and, and education in the people in the field in Afghanistan and in Iraq, both, to make sure they understand what these threats are. Um, everybody in this room has a pretty good intuitive idea of what those things are, if not an in intimate one, but the soldiers in the field don't necessarily. You know, if you're, if you're an ar artillery guy or a, um, a fighter mechanic, you might not have an intimate idea of what those things are. So we're improving our education efforts, too. I would like to ask a yes or no question to each member of the panel. No. Do you, do you feel you are more empowered to do your job under the current Obama administration versus the Bush administration? This is a yes or no question. There are no gray areas. Please answer yes or no. I see bullshit. Yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. I, I'm going to. I also see chicken shit too. I, I'm going to feel quite empowered when this guy passes out on the floor. I don't. I don't think he's drunk. I think he's just an asshole. If you oh. would like a drinking contest? Please bring it this way. Oh. Apparently, you are a chicken shit and not able to answer the question, oh, sir. Oh, oh. I remember when I had my first beer too. <laughs> glad Sam Adams has been making beer that long, sir. Next question, please. <laughs> um, a lot of people around here don't have a traditional education, let's say. The GS schedule doesn't really work with that. Is there any plans to change that at all? Could you ask, we were, we were watching him. We, <laughs> like watching a car wreck. Go ahead. Did you guys hear me at all? Is this thing on? The, the question was, if you have a sort of a non-standard education, the GS schedule doesn't really work. Do you, is there any ch uh, like plans to do anything differently as far as that goes? Uh, you know what my response would be, you know? You, you can always enlist in, in the Air Force. <laughs> And, and we, we would educate you. And, and the other thing is we do have ROTC scholarships, so you can get a standard education and ultimately uh, fit into that structure as it exists. But as far as modifications to the GS structure, um, I, I'm, I'm really, I haven't heard of any. No. There are lots of ways to qualify for those, those positions, and they're not always uh, dependent upon... Um, formal degrees, but it depends upon the position and how the position description is written. Um, and I'll also include that you could apply for a cyber course scholarship as well. Are you basically speaking about the GS pace scale? Is that, can, if, is that correct? What's that? Are you basically speaking about the GS pace scale? Yeah, basically if you don't have yeah. a college degree, <clears throat> yeah. um, you hit a limit. I know that some of the agencies are going to what they call NSPS, basically where they're trying to compete with the outside, with the corporate. So they're trying to get in line uh, with what's going on with uh, corporate America, if that helps you. A lot of times that's also based on position. I mean, it's not, it's not really, I don't think all of it's wrapped around the GS schedule. I know I've hired people and uh, persons uh, like a GS 14 now on my team that doesn't have a college education. I, I, you know, I saw great value in lots of other things that, uh, that this person brought to the table. Uh, our former director did not have a, uh, a college education, GS-15. Very impressive people, um, non-traditional education, um, great value brought to the table with a huge amount of system administration experience and, and understanding of networks. Uh, I, that does not stop you. A lot of times you'll see a little, a little caveat at the end of a, of a position description. It'll say, or equivalent um, experience, blah, blah, blah. So. Uh, Keep looking for things like that, not just uh, 
seeing that four-year thing and feeling like that's going to um, kill you. So um, keep your head up. Let me just quickly add that uh, just a, a story. I, we've got a little Linux guy that works for us. I hired him off the street, and I'm putting him through school. So, I mean, if you've got the talent, there are folks out there that need you. Uh, there are people that will help you get through that education cycle. Uh, it's not a closed loop. Uh, he's not the only one. I've got actually, in my small little tiny shop, uh, I've got three different people that are going through that kind of program. I hired them because they were really, really good at what they did. And I really didn't care about their formal education at the time. They're getting it now, but I really didn't care about where they'd gone to school because they were just really, really talented people. Next question, please. Looking in from the outside, it seems like several different agencies are almost squabbling over who's going to kind of take the lead in uh, the U.S.'s cyber defense. And it kind of seems now that the Air Force is kind of moving to the head of that. Um, my question is basically, when are we going to see more of a unified front of a single entity saying, you know, we are cyber defense as the Air Force is to the air or et cetera? <clears throat> but, yeah, that, it, this is a source of confusion, I think, by, be caused by some of the commercials that came out last year and whatnot. But the, the Air Force is not out to rule the cyber world. We have our own little little section of it. And we want them to take care as good stewards of our own networks to make sure those are secure. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to hold um, adversaries' networks, especially ones related to air forces, at at, uh, at risk. Um, but I, you know, from you know, from a functional standpoint, you know, working with the with the folks at uh, NSA and other uh, services, they're the really at the working level. There's no squabbling over it. I think at the executive level. There's some discussion between DHS and DOD and some advocates in Congress back and forth between those two, so uh, supporting one organization or another. But uh, as far as us, you know, on this table, for example, working together, we don't, I, I, I've never had an issue. Next question. There's a, uh, there's a lot of news about North Korea being a threat to the U.S. or to any country as a uh, nuclear nation or a possible nuclear nation, but I'm wondering what kind of uh, cyber threat do they pose to the United States allies, uh, if any? You hear any news about DDoS attacks or anything coming from North Korea? What kind of threat do they pose, if any? I'll, I'll take a stab since y'all are waiting down there. North Korea is hooked up with 56K dial-up modems. <laughs> and if they can pull all five, all five or six of them together for a DDoS, I'd like to see that happen. This is kind of a multi-part question, um, and it's open to anyone who wants to answer it. I'm sure with your professional experiences, you've been involved in projects that have uncovered zero-day exploits, viruses, worms, and trojans. Um, what do you have that ensures us that you, when you find when you find these exploits, that you contact us and let us know about them publicly, if any at all? And also, if you choose not to let us publicly know about this uncovering of a zero-day exploit, do you keep them for your own personal use in your agencies? Are you able to track these authors and then hire them or recruit them, as opposed to charging them with criminal intent? So I wish it was that sexy, but it's not. Um, you can go to the U.S. CERT webpage, and we post all the information that we know there. You can sign up for the U.S. CERT advisory, and we will email you and let you know when we find out about something. Um, so uh, it's not quite that sexy. My question is another question regarding uh, North Korea. Um, there was a big me media frenzy regarding like uh, the big North Korean DDoS attack. It, it involved a treasury website, among other government and corporate entities. Um, it came out that that was an 8 megabit per second attack, which is like, what, two cable modems? Um, and then with regard to the, the, um, the Russia-Georgia incident, how big is like cyber warfare um, a threat in this new kind of era? Is it really a threat, or is it um, with the media, is, is their focus misplaced? Well, I think you have to be careful about what you read in the media and what you believe. 
Yeah, that's that's very true, um, especially in in regards to Russia and Georgia. Um, certainly, we we interpret what happened there as as uh, either sympathetic or actual virtual um, preparatory fire prior to a actual physical engagement. So uh, we in the military regard that as pretty serious stuff. So we examine that pretty carefully, and we watch how those things were were done, who who actually did them, and um, and try to figure out exactly how we'll handle those things, you know, as they come up again. But but clearly we've seen in the press um, certain nations have come boldly out and said, hey, this is pretty neat stuff, and oh by the way, it's not illegal as far as we can tell, which I thought was pretty interesting some responsible members of other governments saying these things in the press. So, yeah, we take that pretty deadly serious, especially in the military. So I think <clears throat> so I think one of the things that was concerned, particularly as you watch the progression from Estonia to Russia, Georgia, and this is, as Colonel said, the integration of cyber with conventional military operations. And so this is not just going to be a standalone thing that happens in cyberspace, but likely to be a part of a more integrated campaign. So one has to give thought to how one addresses that. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting is these are rarely solely state on state identified activities, and they're, uh, the waters are muddied considerably by you know, hacktivists or patriotic hackers, whatever you want to call them, who are working in similar spaces. And so that makes the attribution problem particularly hard and all this needs to be factored into consideration. Next question. So the, the big internet service providers uh, receive thousands of requests a year for consumer uh, customers' records, their emails, their searches, and in many cases, you guys are the originating parties for some of those requests. Um, now, these internet providers are not equal when it comes to their uh, tactics for responding to these requests. Some of them charge uh, the requesters for the information. Some of them provide it for free. In the case that you claim exigent circumstances, so an emergency, uh, some of them provide it without a subpoena, and some of them say, come back with a subpoena. I'm wondering if any of you can, can share some of your uh, experiences with these companies and t let us know which internet providers are standing their, their ground and saying, come back with a warrant, and which are handing it over for free with no subpoena required. Shot. Um, uh, we, we, I'd, I'd like to get a list of those that are doing it for free. Uh, I've not run into it. We, we issue quite a few subpoenas and search warrants. And, and basically, uh, there are ways to expedite, as you noted, uh, exigent circumstances, but it's all within a very strict legal framework. Uh, on the law enforcement side, uh, if we try to short circuit it, we short circuit our own investigation, so we shoot ourselves in the foot. So uh, I can speak definitively for us, and I'm sure that uh, everyone else is, is the same, is that you gotta, you got to do the paperwork. Unfortunately, we have to cut this short uh, by 7 o'clock. However, if there's anyone interested in doing the QA, we have a QA session room over here in room 103. All of you folks are welcome and encouraged to come over here, and then all the folks who want to ask questions are welcome and encouraged to come over here. But uh, we have to shut it down by 7. Thanks, guys. We've still got five more minutes, folks. I'll try to be quick then. Um, earlier on, the, uh, in the response to one of the first questions, the panel was talking about uh, wanting to have greater cooperation with uh, private industry, uh, you know, in, I guess, in coordinating defensive tactics, investigations, whatever. What sort of carrots or sticks, uh, as appropriate, are you using to get high-level uh, cooperation with private industry? And I, I don't mean like InfraGuard, because a lot of the low-level you know, stuff goes on, but you know, how, how are you doing that, or how can I get my organization to cooperate with uh, law enforcement? Well, it's more than just law enforcement, it's with the community in general, and you can do this um, through the ISACs, okay. through, the, through your sector ISAC, you can join your sector ISAC and participate in that way. Um, you can work directly with US CERT, we're more than happy to do that. Mm -hmm. DOD has a uh, pilot program with the Defense Industrial Base. It's a voluntary program where um, the private sector folks can sign up with DOD. When there's an attack on their system, they notify the Department of Defense. We sanitize that information, 
share it with the rest of government and the rest of the, the uh, companies that have signed up. And we share that not only in an unclassified format, but in uh, classified context, what the threat really is. So it's a brand new pilot program. We have about 29 uh, major defense contractors that are participating in that program right now. Can I get a URL from See me afterwards. Yes, sir. Mine's going to be quick as well. Uh, I work for a Canadian e-commerce site. Uh, we see about $1.5 million worth of fraud every year. Um, a lot of that is being used for money laundering internationally. And my question is, do any of you give a shit, and can you help me in stopping this? <laughs> no. Okay, I'm sorry. that we, we, We've been cut off, so uh, that was the last one.